3D Design for 3D Printing, tutorial number four. In this episode, the focus is on making strong parts, including how to have trapped nuts, plus some design and slicer tips. This video is part of a series on learning 3D design for making custom 3D printed parts using a free Onshape account. I'll link the rest of the playlist below so you can see the previous episodes, including how to make an account and set up your units. In this episode, our aim is to design parts that are strong using some not so obvious techniques. This is my pedestal drill and it's a pretty typical example. At our previous place, it was sitting against a wall and that means I could bolt my drill bits to that wall for easy access. But in the new place, it's freestanding and I've got all of these heavy things that I want nearby, so I need to make a bracket. I figure the upper section of this post should be a nice place for the bracket to clamp before it extends out to the left and holds up all of the things I want nearby. And those items have a combined weight of around 1250 grams, so my solution will need to be compact yet strong. As always, we start by gathering dimensions, and if you need a cheap set of calipers, I have one linked from Amazon in the description. At this stage on the drill, all I can measure is the post diameter and the available height, so I record those down on a piece of paper. And since I don't want a flat shelf, but instead want a contoured one to hold these objects securely, I'm taking basic measurements for those too. Some of them are too wide for the calipers, so a ruler is very handy in these instances. So far in this series, we've been revisiting this list of 3D printing considerations, and one of them is particularly relevant for this tutorial, and that is that the print orientation, and therefore the layer line direction, will dictate how strong parts are. If you're new to 3D printing, I'll link my beginner video about this topic in the description below. In a nutshell, our layer lines will travel vertically up the object, and these are the weakest link, so it's much better to keep objects low and wide for optimal strength. If a 3D printed part is going to fail, it's more than likely going to snap where the layer lines are, rather than the extrusions that form the layer lines tearing apart. And this is easily demonstrated with a simple destructive test, where the same object printed low and wide is much much stronger. If we fast forward to the final design, to take advantage of this principle, we're actually going to split this into three separate parts, so each can print in the strongest way possible. So back into Onshape, and if you want to create a new document, we can come to Create, and then Document. But I'll be adding to this document, TT Tutorials, which is linked in the description. I'm going to come down to the plus, create a new part studio, and then right click on the tab to rename. The first step is to model the post that our clamp will attach to on the drill. And this is simply a sketch with a circle, dimension to the correct diameter, and then extruded to the available height. From here, we can then go forward and design our clamp. This clamp is actually a tricky part because it needs to flex open to fit around the drill post, yet it still needs to be quite strong. We'll begin by drawing another sketch and putting it on top of the drill post. My sketch for this starts with two circles, one for the inner and one for the outer wall of the clamp. I then add a horizontal construction line and above that, Draw the wider geometry where the bolt will go through and interface with the nut to tighten and lock the clamp around the post. Rather than draw this twice, I then use the mirror tool, clicking on my center line, and then everything I click afterwards will be mirrored to the other side of this. And to clean up, I click on the trim tool that has the scissor icon and the shortcut key M, and when you move the mouse above geometry in your sketch, it will be highlighted, so when you click, that portion is then removed. Time to add some dimensions, such as the clearance around the post and the clamp. I need to be generous here, so I leave that at 1.5. Unfortunately, this messed up some of my other geometry, but since it's blue and unconstrained, I can drag it back into position and continue with my dimensioning. Next up, being the thickness of the clamp, and this is really tricky, because too thick and it won't flex open wide enough, but too thin and it won't be strong enough. The opening of the clamp needs to be much bigger than you might expect, otherwise the clamp has no chance of flexing wide enough to go over the post. Partway through dimensioning, I realized the inner and outer circles weren't concentric, so I used the concentric constraint, clicked on one and then the other, which makes them share the same center point. The final dimension is for the width of the opening, and when I add this, everything is black and therefore constrained. So what follows is a simple extrusion, 
I want this to be tall enough that two bolts can fit, so I go for 40 millimeters. Finally, a fillet on the inner corner will once again help the clamp flex over the post. That's our basic part, so next up we need to add some holes and cavities for bolts and trapped nuts. I start a sketch on one of the inner faces and dimension the hole large enough for a 6mm bolt to pass through. I then mirror that hole down to the bottom. To create a hexagon for the trapped nut, I use the inscribed polygon tool. The first click sets the center point, the second click sets the diameter, and the third click sets how many sides the polygon has. An M6 nut is 9.8mm from flat to flat, so I add a little extra and make it 10.5. I can now mirror the hexagon to the bottom, add some dimensions to constrain everything and close the sketch. My inner fillet looks a little bit too big, but luckily we can double click on it, change the radius and modify the design easily. Now comes a series of three extrudes. Firstly, I do an extruded cut for the holes the whole way through the outer clamp. Now I complete another extruded cut for the hexagon, again the whole way through the outer clamp. In hindsight, I probably could have done both of those together. Now for a final extrude, this time just the outer hexagon, setting the thickness for how much plastic we want between the edge and the nut, and correcting the direction. Change the extrude to add and one half is done. For the bolt side, we do a very similar job. We have two circles, dimension them a little bit bigger than the head of the bolt, extrude a cut through the whole outer piece, and then a second extrude adding back the material we need to let the bolt pass through the middle, but still have a surface for it to rest against. At this point, I was worried that my clamp opening still wouldn't be enough, so I went back and modified the original sketch to change it. And as you're about to see, that was probably a good decision. Print orientation is as you see, but just like with the design, the slicing is tricky. Normally for a strong part, I would have quite a high infill, but for this one I lowered it down just to help the part flex around the outside of the post. Regular PLA is plenty strong for this, and the workshop won't get hot enough for it to deform. We start by test fitting for our trapped nuts and bolts, and we can see that the bolt slides through nicely with enough room for it to rotate. The trapped nut is also a nice fit, not so tight that we need to press it in, but our cutout is small enough to stop it from rotating when we don't want it to. Now for the not so sure part, will it fit around the post? It did have a bit of flex, but I still wasn't that confident. However, with a little persuasion, I was pleased to find that it finally snapped into place. Honestly, I was lucky to get this right first go. The next question was whether it would flex close enough to clamp tightly on the pole, and that was a yes. And the final question was when it was clamped that tightly, what was the measurement between the two inner surfaces? And I found that 7mm would be ideal in my case. I couldn't design any more without that crucial 7mm measurement, but now that we have it, let's proceed. The next part I wanted to design was the tray or shelf for all of the items to sit in, and I started by mocking them up in their intended positions. The drill bits in the orange tray I rarely use, so I was happy for them to sit behind, and after that, everything else fell into a natural position. I also wanted a trough at the front to put miscellaneous items. The design for this part is really straightforward, so I'll move quickly. I drew basic shapes to match each item, dimension them to match the real life item, except adding a millimeter per side for a little bit of clearance, and then dragged around the shapes to find the ideal position. After this, I could draw an exterior bounding box. After a lot of experimentation, I got the packaging a little neater, and started to work on the position of the entire tray relative to the clamp. We make this into a solid object with two simple extrusions, one of them upwards to grab the bottom of the parts, and then a second extrusion down to give us a floor. I was worried about the can and the back drill bits being too wobbly, so I created a sketch with an extra border, and extruded these upwards to add some extra material. Add some chamfers and fillets to let the design flow a little better, as well as chamfers on the inner edges to help the parts slide into their trays. And finally, some big chamfers on the inside of the miscellaneous parts tray, just so objects would roll towards the center and be a little bit easier to pick up. A few fillets to finish and our base design is complete. Before we're ready to print, we need to add some holes through this part so we can screw into the third part that will be a bracket. To do this, I start a sketch on the surface and draw a position for a row of circles, the inner circle being big enough for the screw to pass through, and the outer circle being big enough to clear the head of the bolt. To save time, I set up a construction line through the middle and mirror this row of circles down to a second row. 
Everything's black and constrained, so I'm ready to extrude. Similar to before, we extrude one hole the whole way through for the bolts to pass through, and then the outer hole 6mm down to create clearance for the head of the bolt. This part is now ready to print. This part is actually the least crucial for strength out of the three, so I still don't turn up the infill because it's all about saving filament and time. And even like this, this was a 7.5 hour print that I had to run overnight. Test fit time and I start with the spray can and I make sure that it can't fall out from any vibrations. The step drill bits are probably a little bit looser than I would like but they're still not going to fall out. The orange drill bit case is snug but can still lift out if I want to use it. And the blue drill bit case is a snug fit but it moves a little bit more than I would like and I'll probably run some tape along the inner edge to stop this play. Finally, the tray at the front does its job of holding random parts but still makes it easy to pick them up when needed. One last trip to the workshop to work out the width at which I want this tray to sit relative to the clamp. I double check that the operation of the drill won't touch anything and I'm pretty sure I have enough clearance. I use a ruler to work out what width I want and I decide on a measurement of 60mm. This final bracket part needs to be the strongest of the lot, yet it can only be 7mm thick. So let's use some tricks. Firstly, some preparation work. I check the measurement and my parts are already 60mm apart but the tray part is sitting too low relative to the clamp. The quick and dirty way to fix this is to simply transform the tray up 3mm and that puts it into the position I want. Time to start the sketch for the final part which is the bracket and I start it on the inside of the clamp, immediately tracing the two holes as bolts will need to pass through this bracket so I need them in the matching position. I can then use the line tool to draw out the rough shape that I'm after for my bracket with the outline being trapezoidal. I use the dimension tool to add a little bit of clearance between the bracket and the post as well as the base of the bracket and the available room at the bottom of the post and then I start to dimension the other lines, getting them visually where I want them and then adjusting the dimension to a round number. The final dimension for the height of the narrow edge constrains the design and allows me to extrude. Despite the gap in the clamp being bigger, I only have 7mm to play with because that's what I've measured as the clamp is flex shut. The basis of this part is complete, but it's not going to be particularly strong, so let's employ some tricks with our design. We do need to add some material to the bracket to line up with our holes, but believe it or not, we're actually going to make the main bracket stronger by removing material. I start by sectioning off the upper section, and that's the part I'm going to extend outwards to line up with the holes on the tray. I then once again use the offset tool to offset the perimeter of the bracket inwards, giving it a thickness of 5mm. I also add additional perimeters around the two holes, again with an offset of 5mm. Now, as we've done before, we use the trim tool to clean up the sketch and remove the portions of geometry that we don't need. We update our previous extrusion to select the geometry that we want, so with this out of the way, now comes the tricky bit. Well, not so much tricky, but repetitive, because we're going to start a new sketch, draw some simple geometry, and then use the pattern tool to repeat it sideways across the part. To do this, we come up to linear pattern in the middle of the sketch toolbar and then click on our geometry, in our case, the two outer lines. There's two values we can edit. One of them is how many copies will be made and the other is the distance between each copy. You can edit these two values as many times as you like until you're happy with the spacing. And when you are, as prompted by the icon next to the mouse cursor, simply left click in space to finalize the pattern. I then went to the right hand side, drew some matching mirror geometry and repeated the same linear pattern with the same spacing. And this gave me the effect I was after. So now I can close the sketch and here comes the annoying bit. We're looking to extrude everything that fits inside our cutout that we made previously. And that means going through and clicking one by one until we have all of the geometry selected. Fast forward a minute or so and I set my extrusion to end on the back face, selecting it and then hitting the tick to complete this portion of the part. We'll explain why I did this in the slicer. The final part of this bracket doesn't need to be anywhere near as strong and its design is quite straightforward. I trace the mounting circles, set up some geometry around them that extends up like fingers and this will be joined to the rest of the bracket. With the sketch finish, it's a simple matter of selecting our geometry and extruding out 10mm to match the line we drew earlier. 
I add some small chamfers to help the transition between the two surfaces. And then my final procedure is to draw the circles where the bolts will interface when they come through from the top shelf. I'm using M4 bolts here, and normally if you're gonna tap your own thread, the whole size would be 3.5. But as we discovered in the last video, if we add 0.4 to this, expanding it to 3.9, it will generally end up being perfect. Cut those holes out and our part is complete and ready to print. So why did we remove this material and leave this crisscross pattern? When slicing this job, I upped my perimeters as well as my top and bottom solid layers. I also put the infill back up to 55%. And when we look at the G-code preview, we're reminded that the perimeters are much stronger than the infill, even at this high percentage. I think that this part with all of these perimeters means we're gonna have a lot more plastic where we need it compared to if the whole thing was just infill. It's visually interesting and we should use less filament compared to a solid part. Like before, this bracket was printed in PLA and it took a few hours. And in the direction that we need it to be strong, it certainly feels very rigid. So let's insert our M4 bolts through the tray piece and into our bracket. As we hoped, 3.9mm was the perfect hole size for the screws to be able to cut their own thread as they get inserted. Compared to the clamp part, our requirements for strength are nowhere near as high for this junction, so there was no need to include trapped nuts in this part of the design. So far so good, so let's connect these two parts to the part already on the drill. We lift it into place, align the holes on the right hand side, and push through the two M6 bolts to hold it securely. We insert our M6 nuts into the rear of the clamp, and then use an allen key to start tensioning the clamp shut. All finished, but does it work? We already know that everything fits in the shelf, so it's simply a matter of loading up all of the parts and seeing if the bracket is up to the task. And I'm pleased to report that for this situation, the parts we've designed are rock solid. The main problem I need to solve now is the amount of wobble in the whole pedestal drill because it's on uneven flooring. Apart from that, we've achieved our design goal and created a sufficiently strong solution. All done, another problem solved with a custom designed and 3D printed solution. Look out for more episodes in the future as we add more knowledge and skills to our repertoire. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy custom designing and 3D printing parts. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.